Hello and welcome to the third lecture of um, reproducible research in R. If you've watched the previous two lectures, uh, you'll notice that I am sitting now because I got in a little bit of a bike accident and I'm a little bit scratched up. So hopefully I'll heal up, but the leg is a little battered, so I am not standing out of comfort's sake. Um, let that not deter us. So we will go over R and R markdown in today's lecture. And so I'll go straight away and share my screen. We have been using R Studio um, for running R code as well as interacting with the terminal and we'll continue to. Uh, and so you should see the ARM Studio save up. No, I have to be a sluggish. Uh, you'll see our Studio screen, and in it is um, a R Markdown file called Lecture. We went over a little bit the structure of Markdown previously, and so this should hopefully look semi-familiar. This first block is the YAML header which contains information on um, what we're going over today. And so it gives a, these are, these are the lecture notes that are um, runnable. So you can take the lecture notes as an R markdown and compile to either HTML or PDF. For people who are enrolled in the course, there's information on the reading for this week that we will discuss. And it's sort of a, um, a look at our um, its origins as well as uh, its potential future history. This was written in 1998. And so there's probably some things they got right, some things they got a bit uh, wrong. <laughs> and so while we've gone over Markdown be before in the first lecture, where we see this is the sort of uh, syntax of Markdown, where you have um, headings delineated by uh, the pound sign. And so top level heading is one pound sign, subheading is two pound signs, and so on and so on. Um, our markdown basically builds on markdown syntax and allows you to execute our code within a markdown document. And so you can basically have your text and your code for your analysis, for your plotting, built within the actual document. And so when you think about this, you can imagine a situation where you could actually have just one file for your entire project workflow. It could pull in data. It could be a manuscript that has citations and uh, text and figures in it. And then it could also dynamically output all those figures and run analyses as it goes, sort of. Some people do it like this, um, and I'd encourage you to, to look into that. Um, I still like the tech formatting, um, so I use that, but either way. So how you actually sort of embed the, um, the R markdown, or sorry, the R code into the markdown document is through the code block. So we talked about code blocks previously, where it's three back ticks, curly brackets, and then you specify the language that you're coding in, and then you can write your R code within that, or whatever code. So one of the nice things about um, our studio is that it allows you to sort of interact in a drag and drop or a tooltip type way to um, insert code chunks, compile our work down to PDF or HTML, run certain lines, et cetera. And so here you see that there's actually a, a number of different languages that you can write in that it will recognize when you compile, one of them being Bash. And so we learned about Bash in the uh, second lecture in this series, where Bash is the, um, the shell environment where you can issue shell commands like making directories, copying files, removing files, um, et cetera. And so that's really nice that they have that built in because a lot of uh, what if you have a online data resource that you want to pull from, um, you can issue a bash command using wgit or curl or something like that to pull data from an online resource 
and still have our code living alongside of it. And so the ability to have multiple languages in the same file is, is pretty, pretty great. Um, for the sake of this though, we're gonna focus on, um, on R and on learning sort of the basics of R. And this is hopefully going to be taught at the appropriate level, but I know that a lot of people come to this class with already some experience um, in R, and so this might be fairly low level, but hopefully um, you'll still walk away with something. You'll still be like, oh, I didn't realize it worked like that. Um, yeah, so this is just my lecture material that I'm obviously not following that closely, um, but that it goes over what the, the sort of point of our markdown is. Why do we, uh, why is it such a benefit to have um, your code and your text, whether it be explanatory text and documentation or actual manuscript text in the same file. And so this is one point that I didn't really talk about, but I will now, and that's the idea of dynamic data. And so um, the R markdown file that analyzes your data, pulls in the data file and runs it. But let's say that you notice an error on one line and you go and change some aspect of the data or you add data, which is more likely the case. You go out for another field season and all of a sudden there's more data that you can work with. Um, in this R Markdown framework, you can simply add those rows of data and recompile. And the analysis is living or dynamic such that it would update, which is a really, really nice feature. Um, this is also nice if you um, create a template analysis that basically can work with different data that's always structured the same. And so I worked with um, somebody at MIT School of Business to develop an R Markdown file that would basically, you could hand it survey data from different companies and it would compile a PDF report about how that company was doing according to their sort of business analytic mindset. But as long as the data were the same format, which they were for different companies, I could, you could just swap in and out, hit compile, donezo. Like you didn't have to actually go into too much um, detail. Uh, and the specifics of the company, which was neat. And it was a really fun experience. Um, so now we know what an R Markdown file is and what the benefits of R Markdown um, are. And so there's other things that exist that are similar to R Markdown, such as um, Jupyter Notebooks for Python. And I think Jupyter can actually do other languages as well. We're gonna focus on um, R Markdown, our studio here. Um, and so, as I say, there are many ways to compile an R Markdown document. Um, the easiest way is obviously our studio. And so we've gone over our studio a bit when we first discussed the, um, the terminal. And so getting familiar and acquainted with our studio um, is a good task if you don't want to always just work from the terminal. And so um, you'll be learning it if you have, don't have experience with it right alongside me because I'm not used to using it. So I would normally do this um, and compile an R Markdown document um, from within R, which I guess is what this is doing too, but it just gives a nice little button for it. So up in the top here, you see knit, and you can click on the options, and you can see that you have three main options, knit to HTML, knit to PDF, and knit to Word as well as you have information on um, knit with parameters, which requires Shiny. And I'm just going to go ahead and not install Shiny. Um, yeah. So if you don't have our studio or R, these are the links to download it. And this is how Markdown formats tables. Um, and then we can see, let's just go ahead and um, knit to PDF. And so you see, we now have a new tab. Oops. I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to switch it around to um, that entire desktop. So you can see as it compiles, it also um, dupe dupes. There we go. It also opens the compiled PDF. And so here now we see the entire screen and we see the um, 
our studio session on the left, and we see the compiled lecture material on the right after clicking that knit to PDF. And as you do it, it uh, opens up a new tab called our markdown down here. So we have our R console here. We have our terminal window here. That's weird. Um, it has, and then it has information about when it, as it compiles the lecture. So as it compiles, it'll go through and um, update what percentage you are based on um, what it's running. And so each chunk, each chunk is the code chunk separated by the three back ticks, um, tells you something about, um, you can name the chunk and so it tells you where you are at. And so if you have long running analyses or long things that take a while to compile, you can sort of look and be like, oh, that's where it's getting hung up. And then it also comes with um, arguments to the code chunk. And so the most common of those arguments are echo and eval. Echo means, should I print the code to the document, yes or no, true or false? And then eval is, should I actually, or should our studio or our run the R code, um, true or false? So the logical arguments for Boolean. All right. Um, so this assumes that, yeah, I, I sort of covered this already about sort of navigating around our studio and showing you the different sort of things that it can do. Um, this is also going to come into play in, when we talk about version control. We talked about version control already. You can version control through our studio. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I don't have that much experience with it. Let's see how you do that is in the version control tab and you have to set up the project and you hand it the remote which is um, something that we went over last week through that recorded lecture um, and then you can sort of interact more in a gui framework or graphical user interface framework with git and github or git and whatever service you like to use such as uh, bitbucket or uh, gitlab etc Uh, all right, yeah, we talked a bit about this, about how you can run bash code and how you can run R from bash. And so uh, if you didn't want, if you were not a fan of R Studio and you wanted to run, um, or you wanted to compile your R Markdown file separately from um, R Studio, you can use the R Markdown package. So how you would call a function, this is sort of just good practice. Um, when you're calling a function that may exist in other packages um, or you may need to first load in the library. So this, uh, the two colons is a way of indexing exactly what function from a package you want to use. So I can run this even though I haven't called in a library, I haven't loaded the R Markdown library into the workspace. Um, but this is a little bit sort of down the line because we haven't really learned anything about R yet, right? And so um, this is a good time to sort of mention that R as a base um, can do a lot. It's really, really great. But I think one of the reasons why R has sort of become prominent in um, some scientific communities is its ability to have developers that are outside uh, make packages, make these sort of add-on analyses. Um, that can be used. And as well as our studio sort of uh, creates and maintains a lot of really um, solid packages, as well as people like our open sci. Uh, they are doing really great stuff and maintaining some incredibly useful packages. Okay, and so this is how you'd actually go about installing our markdown or installing one of those separate packages. You use the, the function install.packages and then you wrap um, the R markdown as a character string, either using a single quote or you can use the classic double quote. I'll erase that. And then how you load that into the workspace is using library R markdown. So I should already have R markdown installed. We can go back to the console. I'm going to hit control enter, which is a way to run a single line to the console. And now R markdown is in the workspace. And how I can check that is a really useful command for reproducibility. 
and that's session info. And so this is a function that you call with no arguments. And so functions in R are called um, as we've done up here. So library is a function and you have open parentheses and closed parentheses and the arguments of a function go within. So this has no function, or sorry, no arguments, but shows that we have attached a package. And so it gives version and packages, uh, sorry, package names and versions, which is really um, useful. And then here you see these are uh, ones that are loaded in, some of them with base and some of them because of our markdown, but they're not attached. These are all with base. So these are actually just all sort of uh, suggests or depends of, of our markdown. Yes, don't quote me on that, I could be wrong. But it also gives information on what operating system I'm running, what platform, 32 or 64 bit, uh, bit and blah, 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 I'm running Linux and my R version that I'm running. So really, really useful. <clears throat> All right, so now that goes over a lot of the, um, the general sort of uh, background of RStudio and on Markdown and a little bit into sort of libraries and which libraries are important. And that's something that's going to depend on the, going to depend on the end user, um, what libraries you would really like to use. And so with that, we're going to shift and talk about um, what is R and why you should use it. And we're going to learn a bit about R. And so I'm actually going to close the lecture notes and we're going to read and go along with the The tutorial um, that covers our basics as written in our markdown. And first, what I want to talk about are um, variables in R. So variables um, are things like um, a vector of numeric values or um, character values. And uh, there's actually four General types of variables is our list here, and that's numeric, character, factor, and then logical, which you just can only take true or false values. <clears throat> I go a little bit about into variable class, which I won't really cover because um, I think it's maybe a little bit advanced for a beginning user. We will use the class argument and the type of Sorry, the class function and the type of function to explore um, data structures and, and classes, but uh, only in a very superficial way. And so classes are really great because you can make your own class, um, which is really useful when you're, um, when you're developing. But this is a sort of basic tutorial and we, um, that's sort of further down the road. Um, and so how we can define these different variables of uh, different classes is we can do it in many different ways. And so when we define a numeric vector, we have the name on the left hand side, this is the assignment operator, and then we have something that defines the variable. And so C is a function that's short for concatenate. And so that allows you to make the vector. It's not even strictly necessary here. So you can just say one colon four, and that means all of the values between one and four. This could also be written as this. So the concatenate function, and then you can hand it a series of values. You can handle as many as you want. And so we can hit uh, control enter to run this and we can just, let's just run all of them at once. And so we have our numeric vector of length four. Here we have a character vector of length four where I've randomly just pulled from letters. But this also could be a simple, this also could be, hey, typing hard, a simple thing like this, right? And you'll also notice that um, I skipped a letter. That's not not because uh, I'm dumb. <laughs> it's because C is a function, and you just generally want to kind of avoid, even if it's a character vector, right? You want to avoid mixing up function names as variable arguments and the like. And so I typically will just try to avoid 
naming something that is a function at all costs, even if it is just a simple character vector. And C as a character vector um, or as a character string does actually mean nothing relative to the function. We can also look at factors where I've done the same thing. I've ignored the C just out of, out of my own personal um, superstition at that point. Uh, but here we have a factor. And so um, factors are really useful when working with um, different groups of data. Um, but they function similarly to um, characters, right? So we hand a character string and then convert it to factor. And we can explore what these look like in the console below. So we type in num and we get a vector of, of one through four. So it's a vector of length four. So vectors are one dimensional arrays, which means that if I say, um, uh, let's say structure. So structure is a useful um, command, especially when dealing with data frames and matrices to sort of tell you, or lists to tell you what it looks like, what's going on in this object. Um, and so we have a vector called num and it's one, two, three, four. It's not really that um, telling. We can also use something called dim. So that's the dimensions of, um, of a given thing. And that should actually return null because it's a one dimensional. And so the dim command will not return information of anything um, that's not two dimensional, I guess, or multi-dimensional. So it could be three or four, three dimensional, four dimensional, n dimensional. Um, but we won't go into sort of the creation of those type of arrays. Um, but, and then, so the length command is probably what we want to use for vectors. And that just tells us how, how many entries are there in, um, in um, the, the vector. And there are four entries. So it is a length four. We can do the same thing with our character vector. So that's all letters, sorry, all letters between uh, the first four letters of the alphabet. And we can say length of that is four. I also probably should have named it, you know, car is not a function, but n car is a function. And so that's the, that gives you the number of characters per each element. But that's not a here nor there. Try not to name things in the mobile workspace that are functions. That's just good practice that I would probably accidentally um, mess up during some tutorial. Um, and that's a fact. And so the next thing is fact, which is our factor. And what's nice about factors is that it, it gives you not only the raw values of, of uh, the full vector of length four, but it also tells you how many different factor levels there are. And you're working with factors is something that's really useful in R because you can use functions like levels and actually just get the actual levels out if you wanted that. You can also drop levels very easily, um, add levels decently easily, and so it's really sort of useful. And the last is we want to see um, that logical. And so logical is true or false. Uh, notice it's not lowercase, it always has to be uppercase. And so we type in lowercase true, and it's just going to always just gonna self correct us because our studio is silly like that to so an uppercase. You can also just use uh, the first letter capital, so T into F, um, but I'd recommend against that. I'd recommend just taking the time to type out true and false. It's not that hard. Um, and then if we want to see more information, so we don't want to just know the length or the um, other aspects of the vectors, but we actually want to um, see what sort of type they are, we can um, examine properties of the different vectors by using the is dot and then it's the class, you know, the type of name. And so uh, here we can say like, is numeric our numeric vector? And it says true, like it, it results in a boolean of length one. Um, and these are actually incredibly useful for uh, sanity checking things as well as um, removing things that don't follow a certain um, pattern. Uh, and so it can be used as a sort of way to flag errors and things like that. So let's say I'm expecting it's numeric. I use is numeric and hand it um, the factor. It's going to be like, no, that's not, it's not numeric. And that's really useful. And that's sort of what I did right here too. I said, is, I use is factor and I hand it the numeric. They said, no, but is factor fact? Yes. Is logical fact? No. Um, yeah, so quite useful. 
There's also two functions that allow us to look at the type of and the class. And so type of will say the lower level of thing. So if you, it should say type of factor, sorry, type of fact, it should result in, uh, oh, it's going to be integer. So it's integer, which is not that super duper useful. But then we see the class that it is is factor. And the difference between the type of and class is classes can be built up, right? So a, a linear model, when you make that, is a class. But a linear model in terms of type of, like the variable type that it is, is it's a list. It's, a, it's an internal thing to R where it creates this object that has all the information stored as a list object, but has its own class that is inherited from base R that says, no, it's a linear model, it's an LM class. And so um, using both of these in concert, especially when learning will sort of hopefully help and not confuse you um, to sort of get an idea, especially with when you start to get into sort of the two dimensional structures where you have a matrix, you have a list, a data frame, a data frame is a list, but it'll be class data frame, but type of list, if that makes sense. It may not, we're gonna to get to it and then you can think back on this or rewind and we'll get there and it'll be okay. Um, and so like we said before, these vectors are simply one dimensional structures, but we can store them into multi-dimensional um, structures or arrays like matrices, data frames, and lists. And these three things are the most common things um, that you will probably interact with in R because a lot of your data aren't going to be, aren't going to be stored as one dimensional arrays and vectors, they'll be stored as, as a row of data, right? A row of data is like a site that you got and sample and it has different attributes like pH and, and the presence or absence of a species or something like that. Um, and so let's make a data frame. And you can do that by calling it test using the assignment operator, which is there, and then using the data frame function Data frame is a function that handles uh, any number of vectors that you can sort of um, put into it. You can name them like that. And so that would be a column called num, but it's going to be called num anyways because it inherits the name of the vector that you give it. And so we can see that by typing it in simply, um, where you see this is now a two dimensional thing um, that has information on. All of the variables that we made combined. And so we can see if we say type of test, it's going to say list. A data frame is a list of vectors. That's how it works. But if we say class, that should say something different. That's a class of data frame. And that's a good distinction to make. Um, and so now we think we're going, no, we're going to make a, we're going to try to mash our test data frame into a matrix. And so first, let's see the structure of test. And so we, we've used structure previously, but it makes more sense once you get to higher order objects. And so we see this, it gives information on class, it says it's a data frame, it gives information on the number of observations, and it gives information on the number of variables, as well as information on each of the variables in terms of what type they are and the values that they contain. Incredibly useful, the structure argument. So let's run that and let's see, now we have test two. And so let's see the structure of test two, which should be a matrix. And then that's, yeah, when you use structure on matrices, it's a little bit uh, confusing looking because matrices have different attributes. They have um, the column names, row names, et cetera. <clears throat> but basically what this is saying right now is that there's, uh, there's only one type of a value and that's a character. And so it's saying that the dimensions of this, it's a one by four by one by four matrix containing all character. And so we can look at this by looking at class of a single thing. So it's a class of basically a vector. And this is how we subset matrices. You can also use this to subset data frames, right? And so we have a square bracket followed by a comma, and then the column index that we want to, to grab. So this would correspond to grabbing the first column. If we wanted to grab a row, it would simply be that, 
And so you first index rows, comma, then your index of columns. So if you only wanted the first value of the first row in a matrix or data frame, it would be that. And I think I go in to I'll go into it really quick now. And so you can index a data frame using that, using a single um, index like that. You can also handle the vector of values. So let's say I want the first two columns. I can hand it a vector of the indices that I want and we'll return those. Or I can use the dollar sign followed by the name of the column that I wish to grab. Interestingly, I think you can also just name it as uh, index thing. Yeah, you can. And since, this is just one more thing, since test as a data frame, is technically a list of vectors. You can also index it as you would a list, which we'll get into, I think, right now. Yeah, so we have gone over the structure of matrices and data frames, with matrices being um, a little bit limited because remember, it converted everything into character. Values in a matrix can only be of one type. So if you have nothing but numeric values, perfect, use a matrix. If you have values that are, some are strings, some are dates, which we didn't go into, because that's a little bit above what we're going into now, working with dates and R, um, then you want to use a data frame if you have data of more than one type. Another way to deal with data that are more than one type or that are structured um, of different lengths is to use a list. So let's say um, we have our num vector, which is only of length four, and we want to have it live alongside of something that's much bigger, like the vector of values between 1 and 100, which is what that is, and also um, some sort of character string. And so this is a character vector of length 2 containing the values a and b. We can use a list. And so this I call test list. And we can look at it, and it outputs it as such. And so how you index <clears throat> lists is different than how you would index uh, matrices and similar to how you'd index data frames because a data frame is a list. Um, but it's a little bit odd. And so I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's say we want the first we want the first element of the list and that should be the vector of numeric values one through four. And so we do that, it says type double cool. We can also um, use higher order in, it's not really higher order. It's, you can index with single brackets and it'll return a list object and how this looks, but that list object will still contain the numeric vector. So that is what that would look like. And sometimes you might want that and we won't really go into why you might want that, but really quickly, Think about when you want to subset a list. Let's say you have a list where you want the first 10 elements of a list. Or let's, in this case, we have test. Oh, what am I doing? I wanted to say type list. It's still the same. So that what I was trying to do, get at before. And then when we do that, it still says list. Okay, same page. Um, so let's say we want the first two elements of a list to be output. What we do is we want to cut out essentially that third element of the list and um, keep it the output structure as a list object. How we would index it is using single brackets, and that maintains the list object. If you try to use double brackets, it will give you an error. No, it won't. It will just give you the value two. I don't know why I did that. I might bleep that part out. <laughs> Learning things of myself. Okay, so some of this we already covered. Basically, we, we set up our, um, our different types of data. And so now we've gone over vectors and their different types. So 
the numeric factor logical or straight. Um, and then we've gone over matrices and data frames and lists. And now I want to see uh, the different properties that objects can have. And so I sort of went over that alongside of defining um, different uh, things. And so we went over dim. And so dim for that, our test is uh, that data frame object. Now the test is the matrix, I'm sorry. We can look at what test is. Test is the data frame. And so it says four by four, meaning as the first value is the number of rows, the second value is the number of columns. We can use ls. So we use ls previously in the terminal. ls is also a function in R, but like a function, it has to be called with parentheses. If you call a function, a function name without parentheses in R, what it'll do is it'll actually give you the code of the function, which is a system call that uh, says what's in the workspace. And we call the matrix test2. So these are all the things that we have in, the, in the, the current global workspace. So we can see the dim of test two should be the same as the data frame, it's four by four. You can't take a dim of a list, and so it'll type in a dim of a list, and it's like, that doesn't work that way. Because a list is essentially also one dimensional in that um, you can only really get information on the length of a list. And our list is of length three. Another good or useful thing, if you didn't want to get a vector of two uh, outputs when look, querying the uh, dimensions of a matrix or data frame, is using n row or n call. And so that's gone over here. And then we've gone over dim and length. <coughs> And some other commands that we went over that were in um, the terminal or bash tutorial and that also are here are head and tail. Really, really useful commands. And so head prints the first, I think the default is maybe five or 10 lines. I don't actually know, but you can set that. So let's say I, I want to see the head, I want to see the first two lines of test. I give it head and then the first argument is the Thing that I want to view, so then the um, matrix or data frame, and the second, or it actually can also be a list, or and then the second is the number of lines or elements I wish to show. So that shows the first two rows. You can use tail to see the last two rows. And then I think this actually also might work with a list. Let's say head list, the first two elements, and that indexes it for you. So that takes the first two elements of the list which can be useful, but I don't know. I don't know if I've run into a situation where that's been useful for me. Um, yeah, we also sort of started to go over indexing um, because it, it sort of appeared earlier in the lecture. I didn't want um, to just gloss over it until now. And so how you'd index a vector is slightly different than how you'd index a matrix or data frame or a list. And so um, let's say we have our numeric vector and we want the second element. We would have a single square bracket and then the index, the number of the, uh, of the index that we want to pull out. And that should, just do, should provide two. And this is intuitive because what we've learned about indexing matrices or two-dimensional objects um, is simply that you give it a row and a column when you index. Or, uh, or you give it just a row and then it gives you the entire, um, all the column values as a vector. And so it's really the only difference between, that's the, that's the relationship between indexing a new uh, vector versus indexing a um, data frame or matrix. And then we all know where indexing of a list uses two square brackets to sort of extract the information that is in the list container. So if you just use single brackets, it still treats it as a list. Um, and so you have a container that is indexed away from your list, but this is also still a list object. And so you can see that using that syntax. So here it removes that, that outer container and only gives you the character, sorry, the numeric vector. If you use single brackets, this is the 
showing that there's this is a list that contains one element, and that one element is a numeric vector of length four. There's a good like salt shaker analogy that goes around Twitter sometimes that I've seen, but I'm not going to use it now. And we talked about it a little bit here about lists essentially just being one dimensional and how you'd actually go about indexing a list. And this further goes in maybe a, a more succinct or clear fashion than what I've gone over in the video, um, how to actually index uh, entire columns of matrices like we do here. I'll run that <clears throat> or specific just single entries. And so that is the first entry of the first column in the matrix or in the data frame test. Also, these two dimensional objects like test as a data frame or test two as a matrix have information about row and column names. And we can call those using the function column names or row names. And so there we have the column names of test and those are the column names of test, which is very useful. We went into this syntax a little bit about how indexing in data frames is, is um, you can do it a lot of different ways, which I don't know is, is ideal, um, but you can either do it in classic sort of matrix notation where you have square brackets, a comma, and this pulls out the column named uh, num, and this does the same thing and just indexes it using this dollar sign. And then dollar signs only work on data frames and lists. So that's why it may be better to just use the bracket notation, and especially if you're not really sure if, what, if it's a data frame or matrix, or just to keep it consistent between the two. But that's up to you. Um, we can also look at names of lists. And so uh, since um, the test list is a one dimensional array, it can't have column names and row names because that implies the existence of two dimensions, columns and rows. But it can have names. So a vector can have a names argument. And we can look and say, uh, what are the names of, of test lists? And we didn't name them, they're just unnamed. And so we can name them. You can hand names test list a vector of length of the elements in test list with their names. And that's what we do here. What that allows us to do is to index elements by their name, which I think is really um, helpful in many, many situations. And so let's say you had um, a list of countries where each country corresponded to a, each list of them corresponded to a data frame about a country. So it gave information on year and demography and other things like that. Um, you could index it by country and then you can say test list dollar sign and then specify what the name of the country was. So in this case, it's a simple example where I just named it something element two and we can run that and we get back what element two in that list was. Um, and this also can be an index like this in the classic format, I believe. Yeah, so it also just returns that same thing. And it did it for some reason both in line and down here. I don't know why it's doing that. But that's just a bug or and or a feature. I think our student would probably call that a feature. And so this goes over, yeah, the different types of, uh, um, of indexing of lists and gets at that problem of, of list indexing and what type of class it would be. So that's a class list and that's a class numeric meaning you have to really, it's just like the amount that you want to drill down into the list is basically what you can sort of interpret it as. Uh, skip that. Okay, so now we have a good idea about um, the different types of variables that R can have and how to index them and sort of pull out specific bits and bobs that we might want. Um, and now we'll go over sort of the base R functions that tell you structural or uh, numeric characteristics about your data, right? And so things like the, the mean. So we have our test data frame, um, which we can, let's see it. That's our test data frame. And let's say we wanna get that, the mean of the first column there, which is a numeric column. It gives us a mean of 2.5. Let's say we want to take the mean of the second column. It'll give us NA, 
and it will give us an error message that's saying, you can't do that. You can't take a mean of a character vector, which makes sense. We can also use things like standard deviation, median, the overall sum. And so that's, we want to sum the values of the entire column using the sum function. We can also get information on minimum and maximum values, as well as the range. And so all of these are functions that we can provide summary statistics of numeric values, numeric variables, um, or vectors. And so here we can, the mid is one, the max is four, the range is one to four. And so when you say range, it gives you just both min and max in that order. Um, and you can also use the summary command, which is really useful for getting information, not only um, about data frames and matrices, but also um, from higher level classes like linear models and et cetera. Summary is a really, really useful function. And so we see information from summary on test where it gives information on the quantiles, as well as the min, max, and the median. When you use summary on uh, character variables or factor variables, it tells you something a little different. And so um, our character variable here, it gives us a table, I believe, of the different counts for each um, character variable. So we have one instance of each of A, B, C, and D. Um, we can also look at uh, unique. So unique is a way of getting at only unique Ow, leg just hit the desk, that hurt. Unique, except the leg's messed up. Unique is gets at the unique values. And so um, it, it, when you use unique on um, test two, they're all unique values, which returns the entire vector basically. However, if you use unique on um, the factor, it's basically the same as saying levels, and it tells you the unique things. Levels is nice because it just gives you a vector, a character vector of names. Unique still treats it as a factor. This is a, it's a tiny, it's a tiny difference, but it is enough to, um, to maybe drive you crazy depending on, on, uh, on when it rears its ugly head, so to speak. Okay, so now we're going to go into a little bit about conditionals. Um, conditionals are incredibly useful in programming, and we've actually already used conditionals previously uh, a bit, and so only as a function. And so we used a function that called the conditional. A conditional is something that outputs to Boolean. It outputs to logical, and so it, it, it's, um, its result is true or its result is false. And where we saw that is using the is numeric function or the is dot functions. So when we said is dot numeric num, it said true. It had a conditional. It says like, is this true? Yes. Um, and what this is probably doing inside, I and mean, when it's not inside the function, what this is doing inside is um, issuing a a simpler call um, to the conditional. And the use of conditionals looks like this. Use a double equal sign. It has to be double. <laughs> and then that, that's meant to equate two different units. And so I'll show this by example. And so let's say that Brody we store as a character variable called cat. Brody is a cat. Does Brody equal cat? That's what this is saying. Is this true or is this false? It outputs true. Brody is a cat. We can also view that as um, uh, an exclamation point followed by an equal sign translating to is not. And so you'd read this saying, is Brody not a cat? And that outputs false because Brody is a cat. We can look at Brody and that's a cat. That is a variable called Brody, which has the, a single instance, um, a, a one um, unit string, it's a string a called cat. And then we get like Brody equals dog, also false. Brody's not a dog, Brody's a cat. And so we can also look at those, those other is dot functions that are really helpful. So there's is dot data frame, is dot list, and they all output to Boolean. So they all output true or false. And what's really useful when working with data that may contain missing, null, or infinite values 
is the use of is.na, is.null, is.finite. Um, and so these should all output false. Is finite only works for numeric variables. It's not trying to remove um, anything that's yeah, like a factor or, or a string. And then we can lastly use like is character outputs is true. So we know that Brody is a character um, vector. Okay, and so so far we've only gone over um, what this would mean for a single value. Brody was a just a character string. Now let's set, let's try to compare um, Brody, which we know equals cat, to a vector of values. And so here we have a vector uh, called animals. It's all different types of animals, including one NA value. So NAs and R are just for missing data. They have to be capital NA, and they are the bane of many programmers' existences. Um, and so we can use the double equal sign, and that would say, is Brody equal to this vector of animals? And so here, the conditional isn't going to output just a single value. It's going to output a vector of values of length animals, where it's going to evaluate Brody compared to each one of those vector elements. So it's first going to say, is Brody equal dog, which is the first element of animals, and it says false. And then it says, well, is Brody cat? And it says, oh, true, yeah, Brody's cat. And then it's going to say, is Brody mouse? And it's going to be like, no, that's not, you know, Brody's not a mouse, or a giraffe. And then when we get to NA, anything trying to evaluate a conditional against an NA is always going to give you NA. Incredibly useful, because a lot of functions that would try to act on this vector, right? So let's say I want to know the number, I want the number of times that a true is, is output. I can say the sum of a Boolean vector. Boolean, true, false are treated also as zero, one. Zero, false, true, one. So the sum of that should be one, but it's not because you have an NA value in there. So the sum will actually output NA, unless you use the NA.RM um, argument to sum. And we'll see that later. And we can go over that as well in class or in the, in the second lecture. I think this is going to be a little bit of a long lecture unless I cut it down. You can also use any and all, which are really useful conditional functions that say um, either, are any of these things true? So is there at least one instance in this animal vector that corresponds to Brody, which is equal to cat? Or on the flip side, so that should be true. There is at least one. There is one instance where that's true. Cool. The other one is all, which means are all of the entries true? Is Brody a cat, a giraffe, a mouse, and a dog? And the answer is false. Like there's only one instance where um, that boolean is satisfied. And so that is really useful when looking and trying to suss out different structures of your data. Um, because sometimes you want and you sort of need something like all to be true, some conditional like are all of these percentages less than 100? Because you can't have more than 100%. Like, so some threshold, that's really useful to know. We also might, might want to know the index of the vector, which satisfies a conditional statement. And so here before we said um, Brody equals animals right here. And it gave us a vector of length animals. But what if animals was like 100 animals? That's too many animals to keep track of. And so we might want to know what the actual index was. And we can use the which statement or which function for that. And it provides the index of the vector animals, which satisfies the condition. And so it, it could output more than one index. It could output, uh, if Brody was um, a vector that satisfied multiple elements there, uh, it could output more than one thing. You probably want to use a different function or a different statement than the double equals sign for that, but I think we'll go into that next. And so what we know about indexing vectors, you can use the which statement embedded within the square brackets 
to index that animal's vector. So what this is saying is, give me the vector, give me the index, which makes this true, which Brody is equal to this animal, and then feed that index to the animal's vector. So basically, tell me what Brody is. Instead of just typing Brody into the, um, into the, the command prompt or the, the R terminal, you can do that, and it should output the same thing. I'm trying to read what that did here. Uh, see, I'm going over the, the what any and all are useful for. This is also a good way to introduce an if statement, which I think is my goal. Yes. So if statements are conditionals that output as true or false, but basically they, they take a true or false and say, only do this action if it's true. And so we know that any, that this function right here, that this argument right here, it, it outputs to true, right? So we can run it and it says, that's true. So this if statement basically said, or if function, if statement says, if, something is true, do the next thing. Like whatever is in these curly brackets, do that. And if it's not true, then don't do it. And so we can run this entire code chunk. And it's basically saying if any Brody equals and double equals animals is true, if Brody is in this vector of animals, then print Brody is an animal. And we see it print to the screen, Brody is an animal. Okay, and so we can also see um, this fail, right? So let's use all and say Brody is not, if all Brody is not equal animals, and that's false because Brody is contained within the vector animals. That's a, I structured that in a confusing way. It's fun to think about, but um, yeah, don't worry too much about that. Um, and so I think the idea that I'm really trying to get at here is what happens if um, the conditional you hand an if statement is false and it won't do anything. It's gonna skip that. And that's incredibly useful. If statements are probably one of the most used like functions in R probably, especially in terms of like conditionals and a uh, data subsetting and function writing, you, it's essential. And so uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce the idea of an if else statement. And so we, we covered this idea of if where it's, if some condition is met that outputs as Boolean, that outputs as true or false, then, do something. And if that is false, then don't do anything. But there it, it ends the it ends the loop in a sense, or ends the statement. Um, but let's say we, we we can only have two options, right? If if this is true, do this. If it's false, do this. It's a, just a bifurcating path where you have two decisions and you're like, do one or the other. Um, what we can do is use an if else statement. So we have if here, if Brody, if any Brody is in animals, which we know is true, then we're gonna print Brody is an animal. But if Brody is not in animals, if, if any Brody is not in animals, then Brody is not an animal. And so we can say else print Brody is not an animal. And so if we run this, it should say Brody is an animal because she's in that vector. But if we change Brody away from being a cat to being a lion, and we rerun that, it'll say error. Wait, why did it do that? Here we go. Oop, I just erased it. Let's see what we got. Brody, and we got animals. You can see any Brody equals animals. It's because that NA, the NA is messing things up. It's 
So we can use that NA remove equals true. And so that basically just truncates it. It removes that NA that's screwing us up because um, an if statement can't function out of NA. So I'm, I'm accidentally messing myself up by including NAs, but this is a useful demonstration of sort of how NA is messed up up, as well as using um, this argument, which occurs to, in many different functions. If you didn't want to use that argument, you could simply use the NA omit function and hand it the vector animals. And that gives you just the values that are not NA. This if else statement can also be phrased as um, using the if else function. And there you just hand it the single first conditional corresponding to this top one. And then this is what to do if it's true. This is what to do if it's false, is how that's structured. Okay, so I'd like to go on to loops in R. And so loops is another, looping is another sort of fundamental thing, not only in R, but in programming in general. <clears throat> And so here I create two vectors, A and B, and they are um, numeric vectors between one and 10 and between 10 and one. And we can strive for vectorization of code. And so the vectorized version of this that is built into R is adding vectors in a pairwise manner. And so if I say A plus B, a and B are of equal length, which means that the first element of A and the first element of B in the sum is the sum of those two elements. So let's say I want to create a new vector of the sum of A and B and call it D. This means that D1 is going to be the first element of A, 1, plus the first element of B, 10. It's going to be 11 is the first element. Lovely, simple, clean, vectorized code. When you write code, it, it may, you're going to run into a situation where this is just not possible um, and you're going to require looping. And so how we would do that in, um, in sort of the simplest uh, loop, which is a for loop, is you're going to say, um, so we have these two vectors, A and B. You're going to say, first create D as an empty vector using just that C function. So we can do that and say D, D is no, it doesn't have any dimensions yet. It's just this, this empty container. <laughs> and then we can say, um, what we want to actually do is take the first element of A, add it to the first element of B and stick it in that vector D. And that is the first element. Then we want to take the second element of A and the second element of B, add them together and stick that in the second element of D. And so how we can do that is using a for loop. How this is structured is as a function. So for open parenthesis, and then some sort of index. So the most traditional is to use I and then use J uh, for rows and columns respectively, but that's just arbitrary really. Or just has roots in, in mathematical notation. Um, so for here, I just used i, and that's the index. And so we say for i in, and then you give it the, the number of values that i can take <coughs> as a vector. And so here, it's, it's a, uh, we want it to be between 1, which is the first element of a or b, like because we want it to span the entire vector of a and b. So we say 1, 2, the length of the vector. So it's this i can take any value between 1 and 10. And what it's going to do is going to loop through and first treat i as if it is equal to 1. It's going to set i to 1 and then say that the first element or the ith element, which in this case is 1 at first, of d is equal to the ith element of A plus the ith element of B. And then it's going to go again, right? It's going to move on and re-index that i to be the next element of this vector here. So then it's going to be 2. And it's going to say d2 is equal to a2 plus b2. And it's going to do that for all <clears throat> the length of A 
and B, and it's going to output um, the same exact thing that you would get from just adding A and B in the vectorized notation. So hopefully that makes sense of the for loop. I'm trying to read what I'm doing now. All right, so here I'm just indexing a list and, and showing another um, example of what you can do with a for loop. And so here I want the output of um, the loop to be a vector of the means of all the values contained within a list. So I set up a, this list, which I call test list two, containing 100 draws from a random uniform distribution bounded between zero and one. Um, and then also B is equal to five values from that same distribution, independent draws. And then D is a thousand values drawn from that distribution. And so what I wanna do when I, uh, I wanna index each list element and take the mean value of the vector contained within that list element. So I first set up my, um, my container which is just going to be a vector of mean values, but it's currently just an empty vector called out. And then we want to say for i in one to how long the list is. And so because we want that first element of the list, but we also want it to go to the last element of the list. And so that will be, it'll say out one, store that as the mean of that. We can also structure this Hold on. Okay, we can also structure the loop slightly differently, right? If we have a, a list object or um, we can just hand I the entire list, what does that mean? So instead of handing I uh, the vector of one to the length of something and then using that to index each element, I can say for I in test list two. And it's going to take, instead of handing, instead of i being um, an index, like one, two, three, all of a sudden i is going to be that entire list element. And I'll show you what I mean by this here. And I won't use print. I don't know why I actually use print. Because let's just remake that entire problem as before. So we have this test list two. We want to take the mean of each um, numeric vector contained within test list two. Oh, I see why I did it. So now we can't, we can't index this by i, right? Because i now is a numeric vector of a bunch of random pulls from a, a uniform distribution. And so what we can do instead, which is a little bit hacky, and I don't suggest this, is that. And so what this means is that we have i as an empty vector. And then it's saying for i, when i can take the sequential, um, it can take first element of list, then second element of list, then third element of list. Not indexing it, but actually physically like handing it all of that, each numeric vector. Um, and what it's going to do is, uh, recreate out to be the vector of out plus some new value. So what this means when i is that first element is out is still an empty container. And so this just means nothing. Um, and so we can run through this. This is a little bit of a confusing example, but and I don't recommend using it like this, but this should output the same thing as, as the above. Thank you. Oh, there it goes. It was just, I typed something in wrong. Same values, fine. I prefer to use it as an index to use my, my for loops with indices rather than just handing it entire data objects. But um, yeah, there's more on that in the text associated with the lecture. Um, I think this is the last thing, or we'll also go over functions. So apply statements, I won't go over in that much detail, but they're really, really useful. They come in different flavors, such as apply for working with matrices. Um, so you can, uh, yeah, 
over S apply, L apply, and V apply, or also T apply. But really, like most times, you probably use A apply, S apply, or L apply. Um, S apply stands for simplify apply, which that's a needless detail. So let's go over just like the structure of apply and L apply. And then all the other ones are more useful for edge cases or when you develop uh, a little bit further along. So using like V apply. Because um, V apply allows you to sort of tell the, um, exactly what the output format should be, which is really useful. But what apply statements do is, <clears throat> let's say, like before, in this for loop, we had the desire to calculate the mean for each element of a list object. That is basically what L apply is for. It's saying apply a function. So take a function, whatever that function is, and hand it and apply it to each element of test list two. The output of that is going to be a list. L apply always outputs a list. How this works in terms of what you'd hand it to it. So instead of that clunky for loop above, all you'd hand it is the test list two and the function which you want to apply to each element of that list. So let's run this. And you'll see that it outputs a named list where each name corresponds to the names of test list two. And then the value from the function fun that we apply um, over that. And we can use a simplified version. So S in, um, in apply, it's, it simplifies it to a vector. It's just a wrapper of L apply. We can do that and it should be returning the same thing that we saw previously. And so uh, it's a vector, um, now a named vector, ABD of rank three, um, containing the mean values. Okay, and now I'll go into when you would use apply. So apply, instead of L apply, L stands for list. It works on lists, it outputs a list. An apply statement works on matrices and data frames. Because you might want to only take the mean of or some function applied to the rows of a two-dimensional object or the, or sorry, I said the rows of a two-dimensional object or the columns of a two-dimensional object. So apply allows you to set the margins of that, or the margin is what it would be called, which stands for rows or columns, where rows margin equals one, columns margin equals two. And then it goes on, but that's neither here nor there. So let's create a test DF, where we take random poles from three, distant, three different distributions. We have the uniform distribution, R unif. We have the Poisson distribution, R POIS. And we have the uh, binomial distribution with different parameters. So this is a uh, binomial distribution with probability 0.5 and a Poisson with mean and variance point, or sorry, two. So we can look at the head of test df and we see, boom, we got, some, we got a binomial variable, we got some random pulse and uniform variable, we got some Poisson. And so we can use our knowledge of four loops to loop over each column and calculate the mean if we wanted to get the mean of each column. And how we do that is set up the empty vector ret, we call it ret, and we say four i in one through the number of columns. And so I'm just going to use that simple indexing way. Even though a, a data frame is a list so th such that I could just use that other way. So for i in test df. But it'll only be columns. It won't allow me to index rows that way because of the way it's structured. And so this should look familiar where I'm saying um, this is going to start where i equals this first thing, this first element, which is so for that if element, which i corresponds to one, take the mean of the if column of test df. And then we can run that. And it should be a vector of like three because there are three columns in test df and those are the means for that. So that second Poisson variable should be two, but we just we didn't draw enough from that distribution to actually get it that mean accurately. So if we increased it by a bunch, it would convert to upon two. 
That's not either here or there. So we may also want to apply a function across rows. And this is that same thing. It's, a, it's literally the exact same thing, except now I index, highlight it there, test df by row. I'm also forced to now use the unlist function because if you take a row of a data frame, the class is a data frame. If I take the class of a column of a data frame, it is numeric. And that really speaks to a data frame just being a list of vectors, columns, where each column has its own list element. And so unlist is a basic way to just be like, try to like mash apart that data frame structure that is imposed. However, we can also use the apply statements, right? And so much in the, in the same syntax as before with L apply, we have our X equals to test DF. Our margin is two, which means columns. And then the function that we want to calculate is the mean. And that will output sort of in this uh, row means and column means, basically. There are also the functions row means and column means that we can use. That ship with base R, but we, we won't really use that. The last thing that we'll go over in this lecture, which I think is already running a bit long, so I apologize for that, is the writing of functions. Don't write, don't repeat yourself. If you can, if you can write a function, you can then apply to a diverse amount of data types and they'll be useful to you instead of writing a big long script where you have a, a for loop here and then just a for loop here of the same thing, write it as a function. Always write it as a function. Minimize the effort, maximize code modularity. And so this entire time what I've been doing is just trying to calculate the mean of um, either list objects or of columns or rows of data frames. Let's say I have like 20 lists. Am I going to write those L apply statements for each list? No, I'm gonna write a function that can then be applied to each one of those list objects. So here I name this function, I write a function called get L func. I don't know why I called it that. How function assignments work is you assign it just using a normal assignment operator, and then you use the function argument. The function argument takes whatever you give it, right? So it takes arguments that would be normal arguments to a function. And so we can see mean and it opens up here and we have the function mean takes x, which is a vector of values, of numeric values. And then it can also take other arguments, which that's saying, including na remove and trim. I don't know what trim is. Let's make that. All right. Um, Okay, so let's go back where we were. And so these are the function, these are the arguments that you want it to take. So if we wanted to write a function to take the um, mean, or to calculate the mean of each element of a list, we would need to hand it a list, right? But let's make it more, more um, functional. What if we don't just want to calculate the mean of each element? What if we may, we may not want to calculate the variance or the standard deviation or the, Kurtosis, we can't calculate anything, the range, the median, any other function. We can hand it that. We can now hand it saying the function that we wish. So as a, an argument to our function, we hand it a func argument, or it could be named whatever. And how this is structured is, so this, is, this defines the function at first, and then the body of the function. So what is actually being run is in curly brackets below. So in curly brackets below, I set up that S apply statement because S apply is going to be a simplified version of L apply. So it's going to return a vector. And I give it things that aren't defined in the global workspace, right? So it wouldn't be like, I'm not going to hand it test list two. I'm going to hand it something named the same thing as my argument name, which is here called LST. And so it's saying for LST, whatever 
list it is, whatever length it is, 500 elements list, fine, whatever. Apply the fun, so apply a function, and that function is func, which is what we've named our second argument. And here it defaults to using mean. And the defaults of functions are really important um, because if we didn't put that and we didn't hand it any information on func, it would error out. But here, at least, it gives a, a semi-informative command. Like it gives you the mean, which is really useful. Function defaults are useful. OK, so let's run that through. And now it doesn't return anything, right? But now we have get l func over here, you can see my mouse, in the functions um, section of the environment. We can also see that using ls, that we now have this get l func. And so let's apply that to something. We had that uh, test list two, and let's not even let's not even define that second argument. It defaults to mean. It calculates the mean and outputs that vector. Now we can hand it func equals xd. It calculates the standard deviation of that. Incredibly useful. Think about when you're writing functions to make that function as flexible as possible while still serving your needs effectively which I think this sort of does for, for our simple needs now. And lastly, I'll go over a little bit about documenting functions. So I use um, the DevTools, which was originally developed in Roxygen, a uh, method of documenting functions, which is uh, a pound sign followed by a um, the apostrophe, not the backslash, just the straight up and down apostrophe. And then you give it the function title as well as different parameters with the at sign and param. You tell it what it returns, and then you provide examples. So when this compiles, this could actually be ready to be prime time in terms of, this could be worked into a, an R package quite easily. It also tells the user in very clear, so if the user is not you, or if the user is you, it tells the user very clearly what goes into the function and what should come out of the function. And so it's really, really useful to, and necessary to document your functions. So if you don't do them the homework, I'm probably going to take off because I'm a stickler. Documenting functions, really important. And so with that, I'm hoping I didn't go on too long. Um, thank you for your attention. And that is the introduction to R, which we will go into, I'm sure, your questions in more detail in the second part, in the second lecture of, of this course. Um, and if you have any other questions, like leave them in the comments below and I'll try to address them or hand you off to um, other online resources, which there are, are, are plenty that will maybe um, more effective than, than this lecture in, in teaching our basics. So with that, thank you very much and I will see you next time.